deconstructing the past to help you make sense of today. Time for another award-winning episode of Pre-Nicene Perspective with your host, Darren Kalama. They say the victors write the history books, and that becomes painfully clear as we look back on the era of pre-Nicene Christianity. And as we turn back those pages of time, we find not only do the victors write those history books, they also delete them. And not just the books. They delete even the memory and names of people and buildings and statues associated with them. You see, it was a common practice used by the Roman emperors especially, and the Latin name for it was called Damnatio Memoriae. Think of it as the world's largest eraser, and it's the fate suffered by the first Christian Bible of 144 AD and the key people involved in its creation. More on that later. For now, let's look at our basic timeline of pre-Nicene Christianity as it was known by the first Christians before the Damnatio Memoriae. Now, the years that we're going to be discussing here span from 1 AD to 325 AD. 325 AD marks the Council of Nicaea and the end of the pre-Nicene Christian era. There were two main camps of Christians during that era. The first camp is the one that you're probably familiar with, the Judeo-Christians, sometimes called Messianic Jews or Ebionites, and later transformed to the main group that we have today in the form of the Roman Catholic Church, with dozens of denominations springing out of it. Baptists, Evangelicals, Anglicans, the Orthodox, Protestants, Mormons, the list goes on and on. They have many differences. Some have women priests. Some believe in sodomites, quote-unquote, marrying. Some celebrate different holidays on different days. But despite all these differences, they all have a single, unifying, common denominator. And the one thing they all believe is that their god is named Yahweh, the same deity worshipped by Jews, and that Jesus Christ was born of Jews. Now, they all believe this without exception. And this belief, of course, is reflected in their Judeo-Christian Bible. A version, King James, Catholic, there's dozens of them, but... It doesn't really matter. They all have the same Jewish Torah stapled to the front. Now, you know it is the quote-unquote Old Testament after it was renamed in the 3rd century. Now, so far, none of what I have just told you is in debate or controversial. These are simply the facts. And these are the Judeo-Christians, the first camp in our overview. And within this first camp, there were rival groups, again, having vastly different opinions but all maintaining the Jewish Yahweh common denominator and Torah as their core belief. Essentially, their arguments boil down to, should we just get it over with and be Jews or just be kind of Jewish? And you'd be absolutely amazed at the tortured arguments that they used against each other's positions. Now, I'll let them explain it all to you, but for a taste of the infighting, have a look at the Council of Jerusalem in 48 AD. Now, the second camp, or group, is much less known after having suffered the Damnatio Memoriae treatment. For purposes of our discussion, I'm going to refer to them as the Cairo Christians. The Cairo, by the way, is the first symbol used by Christians to identify each other and their places of worship. It's simply the first two Greek letters of the word Christ, chi -ro. It kind of looks like the capital letter P with an X near the bottom of it. Essentially, it's the universal symbol for our risen Christ. The Latin cross symbol replaced it shortly after the Council of Nicaea. Now, if you're listening to FBN radio or a podcast, you can see that Cairo symbol at prenicene.org. Put a dash between pre and Nicene. Now, before I get into their vastly different views on history, timelines, and beliefs, and trust me, it's a pretty long list, let's first start with what both believed. Both camps believed Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Everybody agreed. They also both believed in the extreme importance of the Apostle Paul and his epistles. But everything else is a complete free-for-all. So back to our timeline. 
the Judeo-Christian version you already know about. It's nice and tidy after millennia of semantic bleaching, editing, and whitewashing. But the Cairo version is what we're going to be covering today. And for many of you, it will be the first time hearing any of this. And that's a testament to the power of a Dumnatio Memoriae Edict. Now let's start at the beginning with the most important difference. The Cairo Christians believed Jesus came to and left earth the same way, ascending and descending. In other words, he descended to earth and took on a human form, completely human. And after his crucifixion and resurrection, he left the same way, ascending back to heaven. And when he visited the apostles after the resurrection, well, that's right. He simply descended again and took on a completely human form. Now, so human, in fact, he even shared a meal with them. And after the visit, he did what? Oh, that's right. He ascended back to heaven. Now, did this post-resurrection apostle visit require a second miraculous conception and birth? No. No, there was no need for two Jews in a horse stall in Bethlehem. Sorry. Just ascending and descending. Arriving and leaving the same exact way. Now, you might be saying to yourself, gee, Darren, that does seem to make a little bit more sense. The Judeo-Christian Bible version does seem a little convoluted and tortured as they jammed square pegs into round holes trying to give Jesus a Jewish backstory. But, Darren, I need some convincing. Where did they get this idea anyway? Well, that's a good question, and that brings us to the next big difference between the two pre-Nicene camps their Bibles. Now, one side had a Bible and the other didn't. As a result, the Cairo Christians knew not only how, but precisely when and where Jesus arrived on earth, because it's the first sentence in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Quote, in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Jesus descended into Capernaum, a city in Galilee, unquote. Now, that's a lot packed into one simple sentence. It tells us where, when, and how, very clearly, very precisely. And what year would the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar's reign be? Well, that would be 29 AD based on our calendar. Now, some pre-Nicene Christian denominations like the Marcionites went a step further and really researched it. They say November 24th at around 11 a.m. was the exact day and time. And it does kind of check out because that was the only total solar eclipse in that time frame. And it was only 100% visible where? Yep, right over Capernaum, the exact city named in the first sentence of the first Bible. Now, that first Bible consisted of the Gospel of the Lord. We know it is the revelation received by the Apostle Paul directly from Jesus on the road to Damascus. Just that single Gospel and Paul's original ten epistles. Galatians, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Colossians, Philippians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Laodiceans, and Philemon. That is your first Christian Bible unchanged and unedited since 144 AD. Now, the Judeo-Christians, on the other hand, wouldn't invent a Bible until hundreds of years later in 382 AD. And it would be massive, not one, but four Gospels written by anonymous authors, plus Acts, and 62 extra books, not to mention having an entirely extra religion stapled to the front of it in the form of the Torah. Centuries of councils, synods, committees, editing, crafting, weaving, and translations, all in a Herculean effort to staple two different religions together. And 2,000 years later, that square peg still doesn't fit in the round hole. Nor will it ever. But for a few hundred years at least, there was a time, a golden time, when you had your own God, your own religion, and your own Bible. Now, another interesting fact. After the first Bible was transcribed into codex format and people read it, they could compare it to the Jewish Torah side by side, and they immediately saw that two different gods were being portrayed. It only took one look, and they could see this 
psychotic Yahweh deity that murdered women and children portrayed in the Torah had nothing to do with our God as revealed to us only through Jesus Christ. It was night and day, oil and water, not even close. And they finally had the truth. And those Cairo Christians even outnumbered the Judeo-Christians at one point. They were the biggest Christian denomination in the known world, spanning the breadth of the entire Roman Empire. Now, fragments and traces of the size and influence of the Cairo Christians can still be found even after the scorched earth erasure edict of the Demnatio Memoriae. For example, the oldest inscription in the world bearing the name of Jesus Christ is found on the stone archway of a Marcionite church located in Syria. It was dated 318 AD and bore the words, quote unquote, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Good. And it was written in Greek, by the way. Now, the Marcionites were the largest denomination of all the Cairo Christians, and they were mercilessly persecuted by Roman emperors, Jews, and Judeo-Christians alike. And recently, more evidence of their influence was found in the Vatican Library itself, where a tranche of manuscripts show that St. Jerome's source material for his Latin translations of Paul's epistles are attributed directly to Marcion of Sino. And as another target of the Damnatio Memoriae, you can still see defaced paintings of Marcion, with his head scratched off and his features rendered unrecognizable. And on a side note, because of the amount of background material covered in this episode and the excessive amount of links and footnotes involved um, as we made the production, we created a standalone page for it, which you can find by clicking on the link labeled Pre-Nicene History. Uh, just go to pre-nicene.org, and remember that's pre-nicene.org, and that same link will also be available at firstbiblenetwork.com. Now, back to our story and our timeline. At this point, the Judeo-Christians and their Judaized, stapled-together fairy tale religion was fading pretty fast, and the Jews themselves weren't faring much better after their revolts in 70 and 132 AD, which were crushed mercilessly by the Romans. And I don't think karma is an appropriate word to use here, but I'm really struggling to find a different one when, when I tell you that thousands of these Judeo-Christians were tortured and murdered by Jews during those Jewish revolts of 70 and 132 AD. And that's not me saying it, that's according to Justin Martyr uh, and other historians and uh, early fathers of the church. So again, at this point in history, Yahweh, the desert war god, and his wandering human sacrificing worshipers were about to be swept into the dustbin of history. And you know, the irony of all this is that Yahweh was just one of dozens of gods worshipped by the Jews at one time or another. Yes, gods like Shemash and Molech were worshipped with human sacrifices, babies, by the Jews for centuries, as we read in 1 Kings 11.7 and many other verses. Now, these are, of course, only the stories that they wrote about and which were later translated and made slightly less disgusting before being stapled onto your Christian Bible. The actual reality of the abominations they perform, though, are far far worse than what you've been allowed to know. And that's just the people. The actions of their desert war god are just as repulsive as we read about Yahweh ordering women and children be slaughtered in Ezekiel 9.6. Simply put, these people and their Yahweh deity are completely alien to Christ and our Christian God. And that's exactly why they were rejected by Jesus, not the other way around. And that's why they attempted to kill him not once, but several times, including trying to throw him off a cliff in Nazareth. You see, the pre-Nicene Christians knew all of this. There was no way that they were going to knuckle under to these Judeo-Christians and their stapled-together theology. The memory of Christ's crucifixion was still fresh in their minds. The line in the sand had been drawn. But despite all this, the Judeo-Christians fought back. They refused to let go of their perverted version of Christianity. They refused to part ways with their fanciful and tortured Jewish backstory of Jesus and Yahweh the war god. 
early Judeo-Christian thought leaders like Tertullian, Irenaeus, and others would spend lifetimes writing books attacking the Cairo Christians, and they took careful aim at denominations like the Marcionites when they vented their fury. And I have to admit, they were very good at what they did, but it wasn't enough to stop the tidal wave of truth. And by the way, don't worry. Shortly, I'm going to explain why they did it. What drove them to support what we now know is a total lie. And as an acidic aside, the effort to erase the existence of the first Christian Bible through the Damnatio Memoriae was ruined by Tertullian and Irenaeus because in their zeal to demonize it, they quoted from it so extensively, it survived thanks solely to their attacks on it. In fact, you can download a free copy today of that first Bible at appropriately enough, theveryfirstbible.org.org, and while reading it, you'll be glad to know the Marcionite Church still exists today, and you can visit them at marcionitechurch.org. Same church, same Bible, just as it was over 1,800 years ago. Anyway, as things were at their darkest for the Judeo-Christians and the competing gospel of the Lord was in its ascendancy, two unusually talented and opportunistic people appeared on the scene, and they would change Christianity as we knew it for the next 1,700 years. In fact, no two people are more responsible for transforming Christianity into Judeo-Christianity and then codifying the deed. And their names were Eusebius, who became the bishop of Caesarea in 313 A.D., and the other was Constantine, the Emperor of Rome from 306 to 337 AD. Now, the authorized individual histories of both men are widely distributed and fairly easy to find. Harder to find, though, is the real story of how they both worked to support the other, each with a different goal in mind, but achieving it by walking the same crooked path one helping the other as a way to achieve their own goal, a symbiotic relationship to say the least. Now, Eusebius is known as the quote-unquote father of church history and best known for writing the book Ecclesiastical History, his version of the history of the Judeo-Christians up until that point. He later would also write a book called The Life of Constantine, the semantically bleached biography of same. Now, Constantine had just got done with a civil war between East and West, and he was desperately trying to keep a dying and fractured empire united. And Eusebius, on the other hand, was watching his Judeo-Christian religion vanish before his eyes as the Marcionites and other Cairo denominations were at their peak. And it should be pointed out here that Eusebius and the Judeo-Christians still, at this point, had no Bible of their own to compete with the Marcionites. In fact, they wouldn't be able to get their story straight enough to cobble one together until 382 AD. So we have Constantine, a devout worshiper of the Roman sun god Saul Invictus, frantically trying to find a way to unite his crumbling empire, and Eusebius, a man without a Bible and reduced to renting Yahweh the Hebrew war god for promotional purposes. These were dark days indeed, as they say. But then they met, and that's when the magic happened. Or more accurately, several magic acts happened. One magician would pull a rabbit out of the hat of the other at the same time. Eusebius would make Constantine a suddenly minted Christian, helping him unify the empire. And Constantine would save Eusebius' Bibleless theology and make the Judeo-Christians the state religion of Rome. And that magic act would be called the Council of Nicaea, which was held May 20th through June 19th in the year 325 AD. Think of Eusebius as the fixer, the Winston Wolf of Pulp Fiction fame. And fixing Constantine was going to take a lot of work. And for all of this to work, people would need to remain blissfully unaware of a few tiny details which I'll touch on briefly. Number one, the coin in circulation during the Council of Nicaea showed Constantine on one side and his Roman sun god Saul Invictus on the other. And remember, 
This is a full decade after Constantine's imaginary conversion to Christianity after seeing, and I quote, a holy vision. It ended up being a fairy tale invented by his handler, the fixer Eusebius, and it would be just one of many fables Eusebius would create on his behalf. Number two, literally one year after the Council of Nicaea, Constantine executed his brother-in-law, his nephew, his firstborn son Crispus, and his wife Fausta. The wife was boiled alive, and the son was poisoned. Now then, you were saying something about his Christian conversion? Interestingly, Eusebius, his fellow magician, I guess forgot to mention any of this in his biography of Constantine. Number three, Eusebius was not a historian. As he freely admits, he was a storyteller and PR agent that would leave facts out of his accounts that he deemed quote-unquote not helpful to the Judeo-Christian narrative. In regards to the Old Testament, it's pretty clear that he didn't actually believe any of it, but he had justifications for telling others to believe it. And I quote, It will sometimes be necessary to use falsehood for the benefit of those who need such a mode of treatment. Unquote. Moreover, he's very fond of quoting Plato throughout his books and relies heavily on Plato's for the greater good when justifying the use of false scripture. In short, Eusebius was okay with lying to people about the underpinnings of their faith if, in the end, it was for the greater good. Make of it what you will. Number four. Eusebius was excommunicated by the church at the Council of Antioch in 325 AD, just two months before his fixer role at the Council of Nicaea. He was found guilty of Arian beliefs. You see, he didn't see Jesus as being quite as equal to God as everyone else. Now, he probably got this belief from his adoration of Judaism and Yahweh, but really, who knows? But the fact remains, he was excommunicated just months before stapling the Torah onto your Bible at the Council of Nicaea. But thanks to the help of his fellow magician Constantine, none of this was a problem. Constantine by this time had assumed leadership of the church and was adorned with the title Pontifex Maximus. So Constantine just absolved Eusebius of sin and simply erased the charges of heresy before making him council leader like it never even happened. Number five, Pope Sylvester I refused to attend the Council of Nicaea. However, Constantine, oh, I'm sorry, Pontifex Maximus, wasn't particularly interested in what the Pope thought about it anyway. Number six, bishops in attendance that did not agree with the pronouncements made at the Council were subject to exile and banishment from the entire Roman Empire and many were as a result. You see, the actions at the council ushered in a new wave of attacks on the Marcionites and other Cairo denominations. Constantine ordered their property seized, Bibles put to the torch, and their wealth transferred to this new Roman Catholic Church. The Demnatio Memoriae was also issued against Marcion himself, his church, and the first Bible. All copies of his book Antithesis, in which he proves Yahweh is not our Christian God, well, they were also all hunted down and burned. And just six years after this scorched earth policy was put into place, Constantine issued 50 copies of Eusebius's new Judeo-Christian Bible, which, of course, bore little resemblance to the first. And it was completed with the Torah stapled to the front. And what it was missing was the gospel of the Lord, and it was emblazoned with wholesale changes made to Paul's epistles. In 382 AD, it was adopted as the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. Christian beliefs, doctrine, and dogma had been completely hijacked and inverted in the 29 days of the Council of Nicaea. It all took less than a month. And now you know the rest of the story. And as a reminder, FBN doesn't ask for donations, but you can support the show by simply sharing a link to the episode. If even one lost Christian is found as a result, I'd say you did pretty good. I'm Darren Kalama, and we'll see you next time on Pre-Nicene Perspective. Kill them all, old and young, girls and women, and little children. Does that sound like something Jesus would ever say to you? The first Christians didn't think so either. 
and that's why you won't find the Old Testament in the first Christian Bible of 144 AD. Reconnect with your pre-Nicene Christian roots and the Bible you were meant to have. Ten books and the Gospel of the Lord. Download your free ebook at theveryfirstbible.org.